¡Feliz sábado! ¡Feliz sábado! Muy bien, muy bien. Estoy contento de estar aquí esta mañana. Estoy en la iglesia hispana. Uh, Spanish Church. ¿Over there? Oh, no. Wrong church. You better get with it. Because they say that the heavenly language and the official language in heaven is Spanish. So, start practicing. You got your brothers right next door. And then you can take some courses. I'm pretty sure they're free. It is a pleasure to be in Chesapeake English. I think it's my first time here. Um, I am actually the volunteer lay pastor for the Potomac Conference for the Hispanic uh, Division. I've been with uh, Norfolk Spanish uh, for now almost going on four years. I can't believe it. Uh, been leading the way with that church. Uh, when we got there, it was a small company. Today, uh, we're strong mission. About anywhere from 60 to 75 people worship there. And from that Uh, that group from Norfolk branched off our Chesapeake group. So that's when I was called in because we were branching off to Chesapeake and they wanted to make sure that we could continue to grow the Norfolk Church. I had the pleasure of working under the leadership of Pastor Juan Moreno that you may know. And I got a funny feeling he's next door. He doesn't know I'm here. He thinks I'm in Norfolk. So we're trying to figure out why he doesn't see me on our YouTube channel today. Um, it was a last-minute call from El Pastor eh, Cronel, right? Did I pronounce that correctly? And then, um, he's been so kind to come to our Norfolk Church to speak, and we have another engagement that he's going to comply. So when he called me yesterday, practically crying, are we recording? Are we live? <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> you guys don't forewarn anybody. Just throw them into the lines then, huh? Throw them into the lines then. Uh, believe it or not, English is my second language. Um, so if I mispronounce something, please, I apologize. Um, sometimes the words get mixed up con el español. Um, and if you see that I move around too much, and that's a, well, my mom can tell you the story. Um, that's from childhood. So just a little hyper. But it is a pleasure to be here. You have a beautiful sanctuary. I see that you have pulled away many Hispanics from our churches. We will forgive you at this time. <laughs> We will work diligently to get them back. Must have been a potluck or something they didn't like. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we didn't serve the right enchiladas. Something like that. It is really a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, let, us, uh, let us bow our heads and ask God to lead this service today. Heavenly Father, we thank you because we are here this morning to hear your word. May it be a blessing to our lives. May we put it in practice. May we be a blessing to others. We ask of you, dear Lord, to come soon to take us home. In the name of Jesus Christ, we beg and ask these favors. Amen. 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 Tell the person beside you that God loves you. And let them know he loves you so much that he gave his only son... So that if you believe in him, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen? Not too many people willing to give up their children for somebody else. Especially not in this century. Especially not today. But God, knowing how bad we were going to be, he still gave his son. So that all of us, in fairness, can all believe. It's all about believing. It's all about faith. If you want to grow in Jesus Christ, you got to put your faith in action. You can have faith. Well, you can say you have faith. But if that faith is not moving you, if that faith is not moving somebody else, if that faith is not a blessing for somebody else, then you don't have faith. Because faith without actions does not work. And you know, there's this great verse in the Bible. Let me get my... Glasses here. You know, that's what happens, uh, young people. After you turn 21, you're going to have to go to the dollar store and get a pair of these. I'm telling you, it, it, it's something serious. In the book of Hebrews, if you want to go to Hebrew, and then we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm, I'm more of a storyteller than anything else. 
If we go to the book of Hebrews, and let's read that verse very quickly. And for those who don't understand English, El Libro de Hebreos, chapter 11. Hebreos, Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, if I'm not mistaken in my little notes. And it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. We're talking about God. For he cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So automatically, if you have faith in Christ, if you believe in Christ, if you believe in God, that faith is going to move. It's going to make you move. You're going to want to move. That faith is going to be put in action. See, that's what faith does. It makes you move. When you believe in something, you begin to move towards that thing. It happens in all our daily lives. It happens in sports, education. When we believe in something, we're actually committing to that. We're, we're, we're investing in that, be it thought, idea, person, object, whatever it is. By faith, we believe that our cars are going to turn on in the morning, right? You depend on the vehicle. It's like automatic. You don't think twice to check if you left the light on or something, right? Go to bed and morning, you know, same. How many of us just, you know, go to bed, had our little midnight snack, watched our late night show, and all of a sudden we doze off. Some of us don't, you know, we think it's automatic that we're going to rise and shine the next day. Hmm. See, faith should always move you towards God. Bottom line. Because he's the God of the impossible. See, we do possible. God doesn't do possible. He does impossible. He does the things that we cannot do. That's why I love God so much. See, because in my humanity, I am limited. I can only do so much. So I count on God to do the impossible. To move things and to make things happen. Without God, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. It's all about letting God do things for you. But to make that happen, you have to have faith. Because see, it's not easy. And kids, you don't want to grow up. You don't want to be an adult. If I don't know what I knew today, I would have stayed at the age of seven. I think that was a pretty good age. <laughs> yeah. Then all of a sudden I grew up, wanted to be like everybody else, wanted to be a grown up. And boy, isn't it difficult? It is tough. Man, there's not even a manual with that. Nothing comes with it. You grow up and you're like, ooh, if I would have known this was the case. Seven was a great age. It was a great age. But see, God through faith, through the faith that we have in God, we can go from one stage to the other in life. Knowing that it won't be easy, but knowing he'll be there every step of the way. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of the best verses in the Bible. It says, for I know the plans. Who's saying I know the plans? God knows the plans he has for you. He wrote them down. Got some read it. He has some great plans. And you know what the cool thing about that verse says? That those plans are sort of molded to what we want to be. See, God loves us so much that he lets us decide. It's all about decision-making process, right? You decide to believe. You decide not to believe. You decide to do. You decide not to do. God doesn't obligate anyone. But hey, if you're willing, if you're willing to abide or participate in the plans that he has for you, and you apply faith, oh, you're going to move some mountains. You're going to move them. I'm telling you. And you don't have, you know, the Bible gives us sort of like a measuring cup, right? As to how much faith we should have. And in Spanish, we say, un grano de mostaza. 
A mustard seed, right? Everyone's seen a mustard seed, right? Well, maybe those who are fanatics of mustard, right? You've seen those little mustard seeds. They're tiny. They're just a little mustard seed. If you were to have faith the size of a mustard seed, you know the things that God could do through you? Mmm, that'd be something. That'd be something to see, a sight to see. See, it's not what I do, it's what Jesus Christ does through me. Are you ready for a story? Yeah, the kids have their story, now the big kids are going to have our story. And sometimes, those who know me, know that I always say, I love to read these stories in the Bible time and time again, because you can sort of like squeeze them like a sponge, right? There's always something new, there's always something behind it. And when I was a kid, I remember the story of Moses. And everybody talks about the Moses story, and it's always about the basket, and then, and then they made it into this, you know, the movies where they show, you know, here's this, here's this military man, and an almighty man, and he just leaves these people, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something behind that story that practically nobody mentions. And I was reading the story again, and I said, wait a minute here. There's a lot more to this story. Go to the book of Exodus, chapter 2, and I'll make this as quickly as possible. Chapter, Exodus, chapter 2, verse 1. And we're going to stay around here, and then I'll mention a couple other verses. It says, And there went a man of the house of Levi. Oh, he must have been a good worker. Those, those people from that tribe, they were workers. And he took a wife, a daughter of a Levi. And the woman conceived and bare son, and when she saw him, that he was goodly, or here it says godly, a uh, goodly child, it should be godly child, she'd hid him how many months? Three. Well, this sounds logical to me. What mother has a child and doesn't say that child is a good looking baby? Right? <laughs> Haven't seen one yet. Say, Ooh, look at that boy. Oh, look at that girl. Look at her hair. Right? Listen, you can admit it to me. We've seen some kids that are probably, right? Yeah. And we go to the hospital. We go to their parents' home. Boy, can we be hypocr hypocrites, can't we? <laughs> what a gorgeous baby. And in the back of our minds, we're thinking, that baby's going to have some child because that hair, it's just not going to cut it. Or those ears, right? That's who we are. That's the reality, right? That's who we are. The great thing above all things, to God sees us equal. Amen. Big ears, big nose, bad hair, no hair. We're all precious in his sight. So here's mom, and she sees the baby. She says, what a beautiful baby. In Spanish, the Bible is more, it's much more complimentary because it says she saw that he was precious, says in Spanish, and she hid him three months. Now, ask yourself, how many moms hide their babies for three months? And he was a pretty baby. As we say, he was a pretty boy. How many? I see a couple of you smiling. You're getting me nervous. Why was she hiding her beautiful son? Man, people were wicked back then. So there's a decree that the Israelites, these enslaved babies, were supposedly a menace because what was happening? The Israelites were what? Multiplying. They were being fruitful. And the Egyptians were like, they're beginning to outnumber us. If we let them grow and prosper, they can conquer this land. So they convinced the king, and I, you know what? It takes a lot to convince somebody to kill children. It take, that's how cruel and evil they were. Led by the devil himself, they convinced the king to kill babies, male babies. It's all about being egocentric, being selfish, wanting power. That's the way the devil works. And these poor innocent kids had a target on the back 
when they were going. That's why she was hiding this baby, this child, this beautiful child. But she didn't stop here. See, faith follows up with actions, right? So she didn't take the baby. It says she only hit him how many months? He wasn't there for years. She hit him for three months because she needed to put a plan in action and trust in God. And let's go into the, the next verse. It says, And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bull rushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Now, this is exciting. Listen to what she does. If she doesn't put her faith in action, this Moses story is going backwards. We wouldn't be saying the same story. She trusts God so much that she puts in faith and she puts her faith in action. I couldn't understand this to, clearly to the other day. See, we have some squatters come to our house. You know what squatters are, right? You know that? Those are people that find a vacant house and go in there and deliver. Well, in our deck, we have a table. And that table has an umbrella. I never open that umbrella. It's very rare. But last year, I decided to open the umbrella so I can clean the table. Sure enough, two days after I opened that umbrella, there's a bird nest. Squatters. They're not paying any rent. Now they're going to drink my water, eat my food, and now I can't lower the umbrella. Smart bird. She said, this is a great place to raise a family. Covered from the rain, got me some shade, and the dimensions are perfect. And I looked the first day, and I, all of a sudden, you know, I see she's working on her task there. And I'm here like, I come the next day, and it's done. It is, the house is built. And I'm like, that's not going to last. I was telling my wife, that's just not going to last. We get these rainstorms and everything. Rainstorms and everything. We saw the whole process right before us. Boy, we were taking pictures and video recording. And all of a sudden, before you knew it, there was three heads poking out. And we were so excited. We kept on taking pictures. And all of a sudden, we could see her feeding the babies. The rain came, storms came, winds came, and that thing did not move. All of a sudden, we see the babies getting on the edges. And I'm thinking, why doesn't that edge, you know, just break? Now there's two babies on the edges, and they're flapping their wings and practicing. And I'm here yelling at them, you owe me rent, you owe me rent. <laughs> and they're just laughing at me, and they're flapping their wings. And then comes heartbreak. A week later, they were gone. They took off. They grew. They stretched their wings. And off they went. So I was curious about that nest. I still have it in my garage. I forgot to bring it this morning. What a piece of art. Those things, it's like if she used cement. I practically would hire her to do some masonry work. It was phenomenal. I was telling my wife, this is so hard. This, no wonder why it didn't move. It was like sort of packed up there. It was tremendous. And then I thought about the basket. And I said, now I understand why that basket didn't go to the bottom. She probably made a solid basket. Because she was going to put her son in that basket. And when we do things for our children, we tend to do the best, right? Well, we should. And she made this solid basket to put that beautiful child that she hid for three months to avoid for him to die because there was this law that the king had, the pharaoh had put in place that he had to die. See, he was sentenced to death before he was born. Mm. Telling you now, she puts him in the basket. Let's listen to the story. Puts him in the basket and shoots him flags in the, in the river. Then, so she, she brings him 
to this river as she tells the child's sister, I want you to watch this baby and I want you to make sure he gets to a safe destination. So here's the sister, probably a teenager in the water and here's the baby in the basket. I want you to picture a mother putting her child in a basket, in a river, in a basket that she prepared, maybe a little blanket there. She can't feed him. She can't watch for him. She can't protect him. She doesn't know what's going to happen. All she could do is put him in God's hands to give him a chance. That's all she could do. I could imagine her just weeping and her heart being torn apart, thinking, I may not see this child again. See, because you can have faith. You can put it in God's hands. But when you put it in God's hands, you're putting it in God's will. That's the key. So you have to accept what God's plans are, right? So all of a sudden, she puts him in the water. And his sister, teeny sister, is watching him. She stood afar, verse 4, to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter, oh, oh, wait a minute before. Let me tell you a little story here. A parenthesis. This basket is flowing in the water. It's going the wrong way. The basket is going the wrong way. See, she wanted the basket to go as furthest away from the king, from the pharaoh. And the basket is going to the palace. It's going the wrong way. And what does the sister do? She's probably panicking. Did she touch that basket? No, she didn't. What a smart girl. You see, sometimes we want to move God's hand. Basket's going the wrong way. We got to grab it and push it the other way. And that's what, what we want to do sometimes in our lives, right? We ask God for something. It's not what we want. And then we think it's going the wrong way. When we have faith, like a grano de mostaza, mustard seed, we believe that all things happen according to his will. Because it's his plan. One of us would have grabbed that. I would have grabbed it and said, mm -mm, that's going to the Pharaoh's house. I got to change the, let it go and let God do his thing. See, it was headed in the right direction. All she did was watch it and listen to the story. And it says, And the daughter, verse 5, And the daughter of the Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to go fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Praise God that that basket went to the right place. Right to the enemy's hands. Right to the enemy. But the part that moves me is that the Bible says that she had compassion. Not only does she have compassion for this beautiful child, but she recognizes that it's a Hebrew child. Was that, the, was that the Pharaoh's daughter? What was her obligation? What was her obligation? Hand it over to the Pharaoh. Hey, Dad. Look at what I got here. She probably would have gotten a Lamborghini for doing that. Oh, yeah. Pharaohs like to compensate people. She probably would have got another palace. She could have scored some big political points. See, Jeremiah says that God has a plan. You just have to put your faith in action. And all of a sudden, she has compassion over this child. And she says, this is one of the Hebrew children. Verse 7, then said his sister of the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to the nurse of the Hebrew woman that she may nurse this? Wait a minute. 
This is getting better by the moment. It goes the wrong way, goes into the enemy's hand, the enemy has compassion, and all of a sudden the sister of the baby in the basket says, Hey, you might need somebody to take care of this child. Would you like me to find someone to care for him? Man, God is so good. Mm, he's sneaky too. Mom says, follow the baby. The baby goes into the enemy's hand. And then the daughter, the baby's sister, goes to the Pharaoh's daughter and says, can I find someone to help you care for this child? And the Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse. Oh, wait, wait, wait verse 7, 8. And then verse 8, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's what? Mother. Why are you talking about my mother that way? Who did she pick up? So the baby sister tells the Pharaoh's daughter who had compassion on this Hebrew child, I could find somebody to care for this child for you. She says, go ahead. And who does she choose? Mary. Mom, I got a job for you. Mom was probably heartbroken at home crying. And I can see her daughter running home. Fatigue, mom, mom. And she's probably saying, what's going on? What happened to, to our child, to my child, to your brother? Mom, mom, I got you a job. I don't want a job. I want my son. Tell me about my son. Mom, listen to me. I got you a great job. I don't need a job. I want my son. And I could imagine that back and forth till finally that, that, that daughter was able to say, Hey, Mom, I got you a good paying job. You're going to be the nanny of your own child because that's the way God works. Not only was she going to take care of her child, she was going to get paid to take care of her child because that's the way God works. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of mothers in here that like to get paid to take care of their children, right? Yeah, I see them laughing. I don't want to bring a discord or anything here. See how God works? She put her faith in action, created the basket, put the child in the basket. God sends the child to the best place. It was the enemy's hands. And now the enemy is going to pay the child's mother to raise him. Because that's the way God works. If he has to use your enemy to give you the victory, he will do so. There's no limit in God. Man, this story, this story even gets better. Ready? We're finishing up here. Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me. Now he's talking to the mom. And I will give thee thy wages. I'm going to pay you to take care and raise your child. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Of course she did. It was her son. The one she put in the basket. And it's amazing. How God put compassion to the heart of the Pharaoh's daughter to not give that child into death, but to let that child live. That's the way God works. This does not happen if she doesn't begin to build the basket. If she doesn't begin to believe that God is the almighty, all-powerful God. Just think of what you've asked God and what you would like out of life. So ask yourself the question, have I built that basket? Have I begun to get the material to build that basket? Am I going to do it or am I going to let God do it? See, she began to build the basket. She made the best basket possible. And she put Moses in the hands of the all heavenly father. And we know the rest of the story. What happens? I heard that he was there one day with a whole bunch of people who had just defeated the most powerful army of the world and something called these waters just parted open. Walked them right through. Defeated the largest army, the same army that had trained him. Boy, God knows how to do things in a classy way too. 
See, Moses would have not had the same training and the resources if he would have not gone to the Pharaoh's house. So God supplied all his needs according to his riches and glory. That's what he does. That's what he does. He got the best training, the best education. He got the Christian education from his mother. It wasn't easy. But God called him. He accepted. And boy, did Moses do some great things. To the point where Moses, you know, he had his, he had his ups and downs. He was close to the Holy Land. Couldn't get in because he got a little upset with, those, <laughs> with his people. But guess what? Doesn't he die? And what happens after his death? First class. And then, in the Mount of Transfiguration, he is there. And all because this woman put her faith in action and put a baby in the basket. There's no story without that basket. There's no story without that faith. When you want God to do something in your life, or in the life of other, begin to get the material and begin to work on that basket. Amen. Put it in the basket. Amen. Put it in the water. And let God lead it to where it needs to go. Things may not happen automatically or quickly, but they will happen. Because that's His promise. Jeremiah 29, 11. That's His promise. But your faith has to go along with action. As we were growing up, my parents were divorced. There were four kids. And we used to walk every place. Every place. So to walk to church, work to the grocery store, walk to the... Back then it was really cool because my mom used to send us to this um, berry place. And we actually saw how the milk would go into the cartons. And it was so cool. And we would go with those buggies. And she would give us the money. And we would go and we would buy. We walked every place. We were so skinny. I need to walk every place nowadays. <laughs> we were so skinny. We did exercise every, every day. Rain, snow. And we were from upstate. We're from upstate New York and Puerto Rico. And upstate, you're upstate New York. You're my special friend. Yeah? All right. So that said, we were in Rochester, New York. And it gets cold over there. It's not cold like here. It's summer for me over here when it's 10, 20, 30 degrees. Over there was below 10, 15. And I remember my two other brothers and my sister, my mom, we used to walk to church faithfully. We should come and go from time to time. People would give us a ride. But my mom was of the concept, I just don't want to bother anyone. My mom thinks she's always bothering anyone, but she's a giver. That said, my mom said, I'm going to make a basket. And you know what her basket, she was going to put in the basket? She began to pray for God to give her a car. She had a room set aside in our house that had this uh, rocking chair, this comfortable big, those big rocking chairs from back then. This was like a prototype of a recliner. We used to love it, but we couldn't go in there. She was sent us to death. We went into that room. That was her prayer room. That was her prayer room. And she would go there day after day after day. And she said, kids, we're going to pray for a car. And I remember listening to one or two individuals sort of mock my mom. And some would say, oh, yeah, waiting for you to get that Cadillac. Oh, yeah, waiting for you to get, you know, the Lincoln Continental. Those were the cars from back then. They were classy. My mom faithfully put that basket in in the water faithfully we had some cars in our driveway they weren't worth a nickel people were sort of trying to play God but it wasn't it wasn't what God had planned so that's what happened would you like to know what happened at the end of the story I'll tell you next time when I come back alright okay I'll finish guess what it was Christmas time my dad comes over, and he always brought us a Christmas gift like a week before, put under the tree. And all of a sudden, we're just so excited. We're like, ah, dad's here. And we're rushing. And, and, you know, we're waiting for that big bag of gifts. And there he comes up the porch with a big bag of gifts. And he gives it off to And all of a sudden, my dad says, 
is your mom home? That's weird. They've been divorced for a long time. I would like to speak with her. And I'm thinking, this man has a death wish. Must be dying or something. Something must be good. Now he wants to talk to my mom. So I said, okay, it's your sentence. Mom, uh, dad would like to speak with you. So logically, me as the intelligent child that I am, I scale back because I don't know what's going to happen. Well, then at that moment, we were able to witness the basket and the miracle. My dad takes his hands out of his pocket, takes out a set of keys, and he tells my mom, It's yours. Put the title and registration on it. I'll repeat that. It is yours. Put the title and registration on it. If God has to use even your enemy, he will make it happen. Gave my mom a little red with a black stripe, cool looking little Chevy Vega. And here's the picture to prove it. That's my cool little car. The basket. Make the basket. Create the basket. Put what you want to happen in that basket. Put it in the waters. God will take care of it. He does. He does and he wants to. He loves you so much, he can't contain himself. He wants to do so much for you, but at times we limit him. Take that faith and put it in action and let God make it happen. Don't limit yourself. If you're going to college, you're going to start, want to be a doctor, be the doctor you want to be, but be it for God's honor and glory. If you want to be a mechanic, you want to be a housewife, you want to be a secretary, you want to be an administrative assistant, you want to be uh, just anything you want to be a veterinarian, whatever it is, put it in the basket. Let it flow. And let God move it. See, He has plans for you. He has plans for me. God is a God that sees us at all stages of our life, right? I have many friends today that some of them just changed completely from one, uh, from one job to the other, one profession to the other. They turn around and they say, Louis, I just put myself in God's hands and I let myself go. I have friends who are educators that now are nurses. I have nurses that now are educators. I have friends who are doing other things and now are pastors. I have friends who are mechanics and they just turned around and put it in God's hands. I have some friends that I love dearly. And these friends were really, really struggling. This particular friend didn't have money for rent. Came to the church Sabbath morning and said, Hey, Louis, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent this month. And me, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we should collect some money between all of us. And I'm thinking of a plan. But all that could come out of my mouth was, Have you taken this to God? She said, Sure did. I said, Do you have faith God can make it happen? Sure do. And I said, Then why are you talking to me? She says, well, it's just tough. I just don't know what's going to happen. So that evening, I received a call from that friend. And she's yelling, and she's crying, and I don't understand her one bit. All I can hear was, oh, I'm going to thinking, you're going to have to calm down. <laughs> you either talk English or habla en español. I don't know. Jeringosa, whatever you're talking. She composed herself, and she said... After today's service, a couple came to my house, knocked on the door, and said the following words. God has sent us here today to give you your rent money. We don't know why. Trust me, we fought it. But God kept on telling us, you have to go and give her rent money. We're talking a little bit over $1,000. A 
little over $1,000. I dare you to create your basket. I dare you. I double dare you. <laughs> to create your basket, put it in God's hands, and let him do his thing. Thank you for the invite. God bless and happy Sabbath.